Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you coming out on this evening to talk about vascular disease. I'll be doing a general overview of, of what it is and what you would expect as a patient to experience or encounter if you're seeing a physician about this problem. It'll be a general overview. Please, please let me know if I need to speak up. Right. And um, also, I'll be, I can take questions at the end unless something you feel needs to be clarified during the process of my talk. I'll be ap ha absolutely happy to do that, okay? My goal for you today is to understand what is peripheral vascular disease, what it means when people talk about it, and how it affects your life, and what you would experience or expect if you were to have this problem. We'll be going through terminology and what definitions we're talking about so that when I'm explaining things to you or when your doctor explains something to you, you'll understand specifically what they're talking about so that you're speaking the same language. Additionally, we'll talk about what it is, peripheral vascular disease, we'll define it, who it affects, what are the things that cause it and what are the risk factors for developing it, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So starting with defining our terminology, the body consists of arterial and venous systems, and we generally talk about and treat them separately. So the arterial system is the set of arteries that come from the heart. It brings blood with oxygen and nutrients from the heart throughout your body to your extremities, your arms and legs, to your major organs and your tissues. The venous system brings blood back to the heart and, and to the lungs as well from the tissues, organs and extremities for removal of waste products and collection of, of new oxygen and nutrients. So one is coming out to bring things to your tissues and organs and extremities, the other is bringing things back to the heart and it's a whole system in circulation. So if you look at this picture here, so the veins and the arteries, they run together so in the body, you'll have veins and arteries in your arms, your legs, in your abdomen. And I think that part, part of the reason why people get confused between the arterial system and the venous system is because they're closely associated and they're in the same location. But we'll be talking about the arterial system today and the venous system is a different topic. So peripheral vascular disease is often used by clinicians and specialists interchangeably with the term peripheral arterial disease. And, and generally, when we say peripheral vascular disease, we're specifically talking about the arteries in the body. It's the disease process that affects the major arteries going to and within the extremities. So both the arms and the legs are considered peripheral, and the blood vessels going to those are our peripheral arteries. Um, however, when we speak about peripheral vascular disease, most of the time, people are talking about the legs and the feet. And as I mentioned before, venous disease is a different process and it's evaluated and treated differently from arterial disease. So what happens with peripheral vascular disease, it's a process based on various factors, namely primarily inflammation, that causes hardening and narrowing of the arteries um, outside the heart and the brain, so down to the legs. It, uh, the focus of today's talk, like I mentioned, is on the arteries of the legs and it has various causes and risk factors, which I will get into in a few minutes. So this is a picture here of a normal artery. That's the leg right there with the arteries running down. And this right here is just cut transversely and this is in longitudinally here. So with normal blood flow, the artery has layers. It pumps blood down towards the feet. There's the cells that exchange oxygen and nutrients to the tissues. And then there's the muscular portion of the artery that pumps the blood through. When you have what we call atherosclerotic artery, which is another way of talking about peripheral vascular disease or a hardening of the artery. What that means is that the wall in the artery has become damaged. And when it's damaged, usually due to inflammation from various causes, you get the positive cells and then ultimately uh, calcium and other, th other things into the blood vessel wall. 
and it thickens and hardens. And then what you see here is this artery that was wide open here and he's, he pumping nicely and moving blood out to the extremities and adjusting how much flow with the amount of exercise you do or the amount of oxygen you need becomes hardened and narrowed. So not only is there less blood flow going through it at a certain time, but it also doesn't pump as well as it did before. So peripheral vascular disease affects different people differently. And I'll get into the details about how and why that is. It def it, the symptoms that you may or may not have from it are different based on what arteries are affected. So even though we're talking about peripheral vascular disease and we're talking specifically about the legs, the arteries that go to the legs start in the abdomen. Well, ultimately it starts at your heart, but the, the arteries that directly supply the blood vessel to each leg split right around your belly button and go down to each leg. And so you can have disease that's related to the arteries in the pelvis that feed the legs, or the arteries in the legs that feed the lower leg or the toes and the feet. Additionally, the symptoms that you might develop from peripheral vascular disease are different based on what is causing it, what disease process you have, what your risk factors are, and how you experience the symptoms. Additionally, the degree of the disease, how much narrowing or where those narrowings are, and if there are multiple, will be different in every person. So like I mentioned before, it's different in everybody. So sometimes it's asymptomatic and sometimes it's symptomatic. And what that means is you could be walking around all day long with narrowing and hardening in your arteries and have no idea. And that's similar to patients who have narrowing or hardening of the arteries in the heart. It's a similar process because these are all blood vessels in the body. It's not the same, but it's similar. Um, symptomatic is, as I mentioned, different in everybody. So you may have severe pain in your legs related to the hardening in your arteries, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's more dangerous than somebody who doesn't have symptoms at all. So it's important to know that how bad your personal symptoms are are not necessarily this, the same as how bad the disease process is in you. And some patients explain that they have symptoms like occasional pain from time to time when they do, do heavy exercise, or constant severe pain that never goes away. Um, additionally, some patients have no pain at all, and that's related to damage to their nerves in their legs. And so their first symptoms or signs might be a wound without any pain. And that's how they discover that they have the disease. So who does it affect? Well, a little general overview for you, which is sort of outside the scope of our talk, but just to give you a little bit of perspective on the disease itself. More than 200 million people worldwide are affected by this disease. It's very prevalent. And we've, many studies have noted that the prevalence means how many people at any given time have a disease collectively. It has increased by 25% over the past decade. So we're seeing that it's more prevalent. And it may be related to the fact that the prevalence of diabetes, which is a major risk factor for this disease, is also higher. One thing to note, though, is that if you look at age groups, generally about 5% of patients younger than 50 years old will have this disease, compared to patients over 80 who up to 20% will have it. So in some respects, as you get older, you will develop some hardening of the arteries, and it may ultimately lead to peripheral vascular disease, but you may never develop symptoms from it in your life. In the United States and other uh, what are considered high-income countries, the men and women tend to be equally affected, although there are some studies that show that men have more severe disease when they do have it. In the United States, about 8.5 million people are living with peripheral arterial disease currently. And as people get older, as I mentioned, the disease increases. The average over the overall population is about 11% of people. But the most severe forms of the disease, so the ones that become limb-threatening or sometimes life-threatening, is anywhere from 0.8% to 3%. And it depends on where you look, and it's really hard to identify among people with the disease who are the ones that are the most severe specifically and parse them out from the general population of patients with this disease. So let's get into what are the causes and risk factors. So this is a graph here, which I'll go into the details of all of these, but the risk, this table shows the different risk factors, and then this is the odds ratio, which means that the risk that if you have this factor, how much is either increased or decreased by getting the disease. 
So we're going to talk about this right here is a, is a marker for inflammation. This is cholesterol. This is smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, and as you can and age. And as you can see, all of these will increase your risk to varying degrees. And this, these different bars are just looking at different regions in the world. So it does share many risk factors with other conditions that cause hardening that are caused by hardening of the arteries. For example, heart disease or coronary artery disease, or cerebrovascular disease. And these are the diseases that cause heart attacks and strokes. However, the effects on the body of the different risk factors are different based on where the disease process is happening in your body. And not every patient, every patient who has cardiovascular disease in general usually has hardening of the arteries, but they don't always have all three disease processes to the same severity or even at all. So age is a strong risk factor for peripheral vascular disease. And as I mentioned, about 20% of the population over 80 has peripheral vascular disease. And as you get older, you, ha you have increased risk of having this. More advanced symptoms are seen sometimes in men, although it tends to affect, gen in general, tends to f affect men and women and all genders equally. Smoking. So smoking is a very strong risk factor, factor for this disease. The risk is increased two to four times with smoking. And secondhand smoke can also be a risk factor. So as with coronary artery disease and other processes that, in, that are caused by inflammation in the body, being an active smoker or a former smoker confers a certain amount of risk for developing and also progression of peripheral vascular disease. So if you have peripheral vascular disease and you continue to smoke, it's nearly guaranteed that it will continue to get worse because you've already been identified as somebody who's gonna get this disease process from smoking and it's going to continue to cause inflammation in your blood vessels. It can also counteract the benefits of the treatments that you're doing for treating peripheral vascular disease at the same time if you continue to smoke. Diabetes is additionally a very strong risk factor, and I had mentioned earlier about how the increased prevalence may be related to the increased prevalence of diabetes. It also increases your risk of developing peripheral vascular disease two to four times, similar to smoking. And the age of the patient and the duration of time who has diabetes will also affect your risk. So if you're an older patient with diabetes, you have a higher risk of developing peripheral vascular disease, or if you've had diabetes for more than 10 years, you're at higher risk of developing peripheral vascular disease than if, you, than if you're younger or you've only had diabetes for a short period of time. It also, in general, diabetes reduces overall survival of patients, so not just related to peripheral arterial disease, but also to your overall health. And when you do have peripheral vascular disease, if you have diabetes, it increases your risk that it would cause limb loss or amputation. The combination of smoking and diabetes are very dangerous and they increase the risk for having a more severe version of the disease. And as I mentioned before, they increase your risk of it ultimately ending up in amputation or possibly dying from a cardiovascular cause. So I just wanted to point out there are different parts of the body, as I mentioned before, that are affected when you have different risk factors. So what we see in patients who are smokers here is that generally the damage to the arteries is here in the abdomen and pelvis and in the upper portions of the legs. And so oftentimes patients will prevent, present with cramping in their legs down here due to narrowing of the blood flow down to their feet. Whereas patients with diabetes, and I apologize because this box is not very easy to see, but it's basically there's a little bit of overlap here in the thigh and knees. And patients with diabetes generally develop disease in the arteries down to the lower legs and in the feet. And in addition to that, diabetes injures the nerves in these areas so that you get what, what's called diabetic neuropathy and you don't necessarily have sensation. So you may not get the same symptoms of the vascular disease that you would get if you were smoking. And this is why smoking and diabetes together are so dangerous because they affect different parts of the blood vessel and you can end up having damage from basically top to bottom. Other things that are associated with peripheral vascular disease include high blood pressure. Many times patients who have cardiovascular disease and peripheral vascular disease have high blood pressure. The risk is not as high as smoking or diabetes, but it exists. And having high or abnormal cholesterol is also important. 
Cholesterol can be a little bit confusing for people because we take medications to lower our cholesterol as a general understanding of cholesterol medicine. However, there is a what's called a good cholesterol, and that is an anti-inflammatory molecule in the body that's part of your cholesterol profile. Cholesterol is an integral part of your cells, so it's something your body needs. So it's the dysfunction of the cholesterol processing and movement through your liver and your body that causes the problem, not actual cholesterol, and it's an important distinction to make. So actually, having an elevated total cholesterol can be bad for peripheral vascular disease, but having lower levels of good cholesterol, which is the HDL, that can actually put you at risk of peripheral vascular disease. So it's the ratio of the two that you want, and, and as far as heart disease is concerned, to take it back to that, having a higher HDL, which is the good cholesterol, is more protective than having a high bad cholesterol level. So it actually has more of an impact because of the, because the inflammation is what causes the damage and what puts you at risk. And that molecule is really important, it's anti-inflammatory. And exercising and eating, eating certain foods are the only things that raise the good cholesterol, whereas you can take medications to lower the bad cholesterol. Triglycerides are fats that are in your bloodstream and that's related to diet and having higher triglyceride levels is also uh, at risk. It puts, it puts you at risk for peripheral vascular disease. Um, these levels, the same, there are some medications that lower these triglyceride levels. However, um, exercise and diet modification are also really important for that as well. So how does it diagnose? I just wanna stop for a second to let you know that the first line for diagnosis and identification of peripheral vascular disease is always your primary physician. You see them hopefully more than you see your other physicians and that you should be reviewing how everything is feeling, how things are changing, if you notice difference over time. And doing a physical exam, you can identify first signs or symptoms of getting a good history and physical, you can get first signs or symptoms of peripheral vascular disease in patients. So it's always important to make sure that you do that portion of your healthcare in addition to getting tests and, and, and seeing specialists. So symptoms, signs, and testing. These are the three things that we look at when we talk about uh, peripheral vascular disease. So symptoms are experienced and reported by the patient. So that would be something you're feeling, you're noticing, that's bothering you, that's outside your, your normal, that you're reporting to your physician to tell them that something's not right. Signs are visible effects of the disease, and it can be seen by you or by your physician and will be seen on exam and will be a telling, telling us there's something wrong here, we need to look more carefully into it. And then the testing, these testings can be invasive or non-invasive. They can be screening tests. We recently had a, a screening for peripheral vascular disease here in the, in the auditorium. Screening tests are good to say whether or not you have narrowing of the arteries, but they don't necessarily tell you that you're at risk of having any problems from it. And then going to more non-invasive testing, if you have targeted testing for people you know have vascular disease, and then invasive testing where you can do diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, and then we get into treatment. So, as far as symptoms, like I mentioned before, patients can be asymptomatic. And we see the, I, these large numbers I told you across the country and across the world, the majority of the patients who have peripheral vascular disease are asymptomatic. They don't have symptoms, they don't notice that their arteries are narrowed, they're going about their day feeling just fine and not being limited. Claudication is a term that talks about, it's very specific to peripheral arterial disease, and it talks about the pain or discomfort patients experience due to a lack of blood flow. So it can be anywhere from mild to severe pain, and generally it's only experienced with exercise or exertion. Now patients don't read the textbooks, so you won't always have the best description, the way we read it in the textbook as physicians, of your symptoms. So generally when I'm talking to patients about claudication, which is a very specific vascular symptom, you get the story about, some people describe it as fatigue of their calf muscles or their thigh or their buttock. Some people actually experience it as pain, but it's very specifically Onset comes when you walk or exercise, and when you stop and rest, it's immediately relieved. 
And the way you can think about that is because, because as I showed you before, the arteries are narrowed and there's blockages, there's only a certain amount of blood flow that can get through. And the arteries are hardened so they can't get bigger or increase their pressure to accommodate that increased need. And as you exercise, your muscles are saying, we're expending more energy, we need more oxygen. And the blood vessels are saying, we can't get it to you. So it's like if you're lifting heavy weights over and over and then suddenly you get tired and shaky and you have to rest. And then as soon as you stop doing the weightlifting, your arm feels better. And you may be sore the next day, but that it's the immediate need for that extra oxygen. And as with claudication, exercise, doing it over and over and training your muscles to tolerate that level of decreased oxygen actually helps with those symptoms. Rest pain is another very specific vascular term. And this kind of pain happens at rest. That's why we call it rest pain. This pain is continuous and generally it's worse at night with the leg elevated. And that's because patients who have rest pain have very severe vascular disease. And the blood flow is so limited that the tissues are crying out for help. They're saying that there's not enough blood supply and we need more and the nerves are saying, you know, we need more and it's, it's painful. So the reason why it's worse at night and with that leg elevation is because one of the few things that actually helps bring the blood flow to the feet is gravity. So when you're standing or dangling your legs, gravity's pulling the blood down to your feet and helping get that little trickle down there. And when you put your leg up, it hurts because now you don't have gravity help getting the blood there and the arteries are not pumping it all the way through. So generally patients will say that they're laying in bed at night and they feel the pain and they dangle. And so they'll sleep all night with their leg dangling over the edge of the bed to get that blood supply to their toes. And that usually doesn't come and go. So sometimes patients, the thing about pain related to vascular disease is patients who have diabetes also can have pain in their nerves. And you can get shooting pains down your legs or constant pain in your feet. And so determining the difference between pain related to your vascular disease and pain related to your diabetes can be difficult. As far as claudication, so I mentioned this already, I kind of went through this already, but we can review again. Claudication is the intermittent pain that you get from exertion. So if I had you, and we actually have a test we can do where I had you get on a treadmill and walk, you could, you could, you could predict, because you're so used to it, how long you could go before you would start experiencing the pain. And then as soon as you stopped, the pain would go away. Depending on the level of your body that's affected, so if it's in the pelvis or the abdomen, then generally you feel the pain in your buttock or your thighs. And if you have narrowings lower down in your legs, then you feel your lower leg or your calf. Generally, patient, the most common symptom is in the lower leg or the calf. That's a more classic symptom that patients will have. And when we ask patients about claudication, this intermittent symptom, it's generally measured based on the distance you can go before experiencing symptoms. And in order to normalize that across different physicians and for everyone to understand whether your symptoms are getting better or worse, a doctor might ask you, how many blocks can you walk before you start experiencing symptoms? And it's really important to know, because because claudication is not limb threatening, it's important to know how much is it interfering with your daily life. So are you not able to go to work? Are you not able to go to the grocery store? Are you not able to even walk around your house because the symptoms are so severe? Because if they're not that bad, it may be beneficial to not do an aggressive or invasive intervention if you're able to tolerate the symptoms and you can work through by exercising or taking medications. So the details of how they affect your life are really important and it's important to think about that as a patient as well. Rest pain, as I mentioned, is persistent pain at rest. It's almost always in the feet and the toes because they're the furthest away from your heart. And it worsens with elevation of the leg. So we can actually reproduce that by having a patient lay on the exam table and lifting their leg up above their head and the foot usually gets pale. So even though they haven't had their leg up for a while and they're not gonna have the rest pain from laying like that, you have complete loss of color in the foot. And then when you dangle it over the edge, it becomes bright red and purple and because blood is very dependent on the gravity. And it's, it's easy to see. So signs, like I mentioned before, signs, signs are things you can see or feel or uh, identify on exam. So, and when I say decreased sensation, it's not, so you can have decreased sensation in your foot and when somebody's touching it can feel tingly or numb or sort of like it's asleep. 
You can have cool feet or toes, so you can notice that one foot is colder than the other if one side is more affected, or your toes can turn blue, and even to the most extreme extent could even turn black or become gang is what we call gangrene, where the tissues just have slowly died off and turn black. A thing that, that happens because the hair follicles and the blood supply is limited, you lose the hair on your toes and the top of your foot and sometimes around your ankles. So the skin becomes a little bit shiny in that area. You can have thickening of the toenails. You'll notice if you get a little cut that your wound will be slow to heal or maybe not heal at all. And like I mentioned, you can develop ulcers or gangrene. So patients who have pain as their primary symptom, unless they get they drop something or they bump into something or they get into an accident, they generally come because of the pain before they develop a wound. But that being said, patients who have diabetes don't always have sensation. So they may not feel a wound developing. So even if they get claudication, sometimes when they walk, they might be getting a blister from their shoe and they never noticed. And then they don't notice until it's an infection or it's, it's a big open wound. So we always, as vascular surgeons, take off everybody's socks and shoes and look at feet. Because sometimes patients themselves don't even know that they have a wound on their foot. So tests we can do. So these are tests that can be done either in your primary physician's office or with your vascular specialist, your vascular surgeon. An ankle brachial index is, can be a screening test and also a surveillance test. So I'll show pictures and then I'll explain a little better. And toe pressure is basically just similar to the ABI, but it measures the pressure in the toe itself. But it can be more accurate patients with diabetes. So here is someone blowing up a blood pressure cuff and listening with a, this is a Doppler. It listens for blood flow through the blood vessel. It's a little mini sonography. It, so that is a simple version of it. That's where you check the ankle pressure. And what, what we do with the ABI is we measure the blood pressure in the brachial artery here and the blood pressure in the ankle here. And the, the way that the heart pumps, the blood pressure in the arm and the blood pressure in the ankle should be equal. So that ratio from the ankle to the brachial artery should be one. That's normal. That means that the, there's enough blood flow getting to your foot and it's normal and that's what's to be expected. And then based on if there's decreased flow, the lower the ratio, the more likely you are to have peripheral vascular disease or symptoms related to it. This is a more comprehensive test and that's what's reflected in this. Generally, these are done by vascular specialists and vascular surgeons. This is called a profile and this tells us where the change in blood pressure occurs. So if this number is not the same as this number, this number is only 30, but this number is 160 and this number is 140 and then this one's suddenly 60, then we know based on that change that that we're expecting a problem in this area. So this is a really good non-invasive test for specialists to say, where might you have a disease and where might we expect it to occur? So if someone's having claudication symptoms, you can know maybe where their problem is before having to do any intervention. And you can have an idea, if you were to do an intervention, of where you might be headed towards. So arterial ultrasound. This is actually taking an ultrasound probe and getting pictures of the blood vessel. We get, to hear, we get to hear how the blood flow sounds going through the artery, and based on how it sounds, we can predict whether it's normal flow or not. We can see the outline of the blood vessel, and if there's calcium in the wall, which is narrowing in the wall, it shows us the picture, so you can see narrowings. It also measures the rate of flow through the blood vessels, and if there's a change in the rate of flow, it can tell us how severe the narrowing is. So it gives a little more detailed information about if you know there's a blockage somewhere, how is it affecting the flow, where is it located, what does it look like, and it can also help direct therapy or treatment. So this is a picture of somebody getting an ultrasound here of their leg that's down at the ankle. This is up here in the thigh, the lower thigh. This here is the popliteal artery. What we like to see is one, two, three. It goes up, down, up, and you can hear it on the machine. And then this is a picture of the artery going long ways down the leg. That's the artery wall. That's the blood flow. That tells you the direction of the flow. That's the vein right there. So this is a normal artery duplex. So then we get into the more invasive things, so CAT scans. 
CAT scan is not technically an invasive procedure because you're not poking the arteries or anything. But we do you do have contrast dye that gets injected into the veins so that it lights up the arteries and you can see the blood flow through it. The contrast dye basically creates a bright picture on the CAT scan. So when you take a when you take the CAT scan of the abdomen, the pelvis, the legs, you'll see the arteries light up and you'll see whether or not they're filling with the contrast dye. This is a good diagnostic tool in a lot of cases, not all of them. Um, you can't treat during these procedures, obviously. So arteries in the legs are much easier to see on an ultrasound because they're superficial, they're near the surface, whereas in the abdomen or in the pelvis, seeing them with an ultrasound gives you very limited information because you have, obviously, your organs in the abdomen in, in the way. So a lot of times you use a CAT scan to, to more carefully look at the arteries in the abdomen and the pelvis. And then angiogram is a more invasive test. You poke the artery directly and you inject the contrast and it's generally a vascular surgeon. Some cardiologists do this for the heart as well. And you inject the dye into the arteries and you take pictures in real time. So it's a dynamic picture of what's going on. And at the same time, you can actually treat the patient during the angiogram. So this is just a couple pictures of a reconstruction, a 3D reconstruction of a CAT scan. So here you can see, this is the aorta coming down. It's if I cut you in half front ways. And we opened you up and looked like a book. So this is the aorta coming down. These are the arteries to the kidneys. This one's going down to the intestines. This one's going to the spleen and the liver here. So that, that's, that's a, it's a really good picture if you had a blockage. You say you had thigh pain, you might end up, we might end up finding a blockage right here in one of the pelvic arteries. This is all of it going down to the legs here. So this is great generally in normal blood flow. For the abdomen, it's great because like I said, you can see inside that you wouldn't be able to do with an, an ultrasound. In the legs, if there's disease, the flow will be slow and nothing will fill up. So it is not as helpful as an angiogram. And this is a picture of an angiogram and some of you may have had it, I don't know. But basically what we do is, and you can see here, this is coming from the groin. Same thing as if you're you're looking at somebody like this. We poke the groin with, an, uh, with a little needle and we put this, this is a, what we call a sheath. It placed in the artery and this catheter goes right here. That's what that, that light line is in there. And we inject dye and we take pictures and we see the way it flows, how fast it flows. It's the same on both sides if there are blockages in the artery. And then at the same time, through this little sheath, which is inside the artery, we can treat a, a narrowing or a blockage if we need to. This is a picture of a foot. So I, like if you took this person and had them turn their foot toes out, this is the heel here, this is the ankle, and that's the toes right here. And this is looking at the blood, the blood flow down to the foot. So if everything's normal, you should have two major blood vessels coming down into your foot and feeding all the blood, blood supply to your foot. So how is it treated? I mentioned it a little bit. I think it's really important to know that risk factors that can be modified should be modified. And not only in patients who are asymptomatic, but in everybody. So if you already have symptoms, it's not too late and you just say, forget it and I'm gonna keep smoking. You can actually improve your prognosis by modifying your risk factors. So smoking cessation is the very first thing. If you're smoking, you should stop and never smoke again. You can not completely repair damage done to the blood vessels by smoking. However, by quitting smoking, however, you can prevent further damage. And sometimes the arteries can repair themselves or areas that were at risk can, can heal. Because it depends on what stage of the inflammation the blood vessel is, whether or not it, it can be fixed. Increasing activity and exercise are extremely important. That, like I said, trains the muscles, brings increased blood flow to the muscles. In addition, it increases your good cholesterol and decreases inflammation and decreases blood pressure overall. Controlling your blood pressure and your blood sugar. So if you have diabetes, generally the Society for Vascular Surgery says to get your hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of how much sugar is in your blood over a period of time, less than seven, excuse me, and you should be taking blood pressure medications prescribed by your doctor to control your blood pressure. Reducing inflammation and improving nutrition. So. Controlling your cholesterol with a statin medication is helpful. 
and is, re is re recommended in patients who have symptoms of peripheral vascular disease. Statin medications also reduce inflammation of the blood vessel and what we, do what we call stabilize plaques, which means that in an unstable plaque, in a situation where the blood clot can form, and it can either get bigger, the artery could clot off, or a piece of a, piece of a plaque could, could go to a distal artery and block that. So not only do they lower your cholesterol, but they also reduce inflammation. Improving nutrition, so there are foods and, and things about your diet that are extremely inflammatory and can contribute to this in a way that's not actually measurable because it's really hard to isolate what people are eating and say this is the thing that's causing all of your problems. But in general, we know some basic things about things that are inflammatory like deep frying foods, using unstable vegetable oils to cook foods, and eating highly processed foods with tons of chemicals that your body's not used to processing. So just really focusing on eating whole foods, things that you can actually know what the ingredients say, something you have seen before or heard of before. Like it's, it's, it seems a little bit silly the way I'm describing it, but if you look carefully, you'll be really astonished at the level of which, if you look at the ingredients of the food that you're eating, the words that you couldn't even pronounce, even if you were a scientist, you know, and, and it doesn't make sense why we're putting the, those things in our body, and they contribute to inflammation. And the number one thing that everything boils down to when it comes to blood vessel disease is inflammation. So smoking causes inflammation, diabetes causes inflammation, high blood pressure causes inflammation, abnormal cholesterol profile causes inflammation, and a low, good cholesterol prevents your body from fixing the inflammation. So it all really boils down to inflammation, and all of these things are focused on stopping the assault on your blood vessels and getting the inflammation to heal and allowing them to, to function normally. For patients with claudication, so same recommendations. Oh, I should also mention that generally patients who have peripheral vascular disease are usually on an antiplatelet medication, so like an aspirin, or sometimes an alternative like Plavix, clopidogrel. Um, that would be decided by your physician with you. And so that's just something to know. Supervised exercise program for claudication. So claudication is not a limb-threatening symptom. If you have this symptom from peripheral vascular disease, you're not necessarily immediately at risk of using, losing your leg. The biggest thing that you have with claudication is that it affects your daily life. So you're limited in things you can do. So the goal of a supervised exercise program is to help you get to a point where the pain is better or gone or en tolerable enough that you can go about your life and enjoy yourself without having to stop and rest and not participate in your life. It's the number one recommended treatment for this symptom. It, 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 if you focus on this exercise program, it will improve your symptoms. It also improves, like I mentioned, your overall cardiovascular status because it helps modify your other risk factors. And so for a supervised program, if you can have it, it's walking for 30 to 45 minutes at a time, three to four times per week in a supervised setting. So there is the Washington Hospital has now a vascular rehab that does a supervised exercise program for claudication. And they previously, in the same area that they did it for cardiac rehab, they now do it for vascular because the importance of exercising and doing that for this disease process to prevent the need for surgeries or intervention is really important. So if you can't, do a supervised program, you can still do the program. It's just walking for anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. Generally, we recommend walking for longer if you're doing it on your own because you can walk slower so you're not pushing yourself too much without supervision and you're getting enough exercise in. You do it three to five times a week and we, we recommend doing this for a 12-week period, giving your body time to heal and adjust and to improve from your symptoms. There are medications that can be prescribed for this, but the medications themselves for the symptoms of claudication are different based on your other problems. So if you have heart failure or heart problems, there's certain medications you can't take. So that would be something to discuss. If you got to the point where you're being treated for claudication, then you would discuss it with whoever was treating you to decide whether or not a medication for this would be needed because generally the exercise program itself really works. So severe peripheral vascular disease, breast pain or wounds, as I mentioned, or both sometimes. 
So there are multiple ways of approaching it. Re uh, endovascular repair means treating the vessels from within. So that was when I showed you the picture of the angiogram, putting the catheters and the wires inside the blood vessels, taking pictures of the narrowings, and then treating them from the inside out. So whether it's blowing up a balloon or putting a stent to open up the passageway and let the blood go through. And then there's open surgery, and depending on where the disease is and what it is, it could be removal of the blockage or the plaque from inside the artery or a bypass of it altogether. And like I said, it depends on the location and the extent of the blockage. So here's just a little demonstration of endovascular treatment. Here you see the artery with the blockage right here. This is cut longitudinally here. And we generally, so if you're treating, say, the right leg, you would go from the left side because it gives you space to work. So you can see the whole other leg from the other side. So you come down with your balloon and your wire, and you do it all with under x-ray supervision. So you shoot the dye, you find the area, and then you're taking pictures the whole time to watch yourself. So you blow up the balloon, you hold it up for a given amount of time, and then the artery, now the plaque doesn't go away because you're not removing it, but the artery inside, the passageway, is opened up and the flow is improved. And then stents can also be placed. So depending on the operator, the type of blockage, and, the, and sometimes even what, what result you get with a balloon, you may decide to place a stent. These are generally nitinol. Sometimes they're covered with what we call PTFE, which is just the synthetic polyester. That's medical grade that's used for stents, but generally they're usually a bit what we call bare metal stent here. Sometimes they have medications on them, drug-eluting balloons or drug-coated drug -coated balloons or drug-eluting stents that, that are used to prevent the same process of inflammation from happening again inside the stent. So they block inflammation in that focal area and prevent the new blockage from forming. So if you say you do a balloon and it doesn't work, or maybe this is completely blocked and you don't think the balloon's gonna keep it open, so you decide you put the stent, you, you, you deploy it, and then the stent is now the passageway through which the blood will flow. So this is a picture of a leg. This is the knee down here and the thigh, and the groin is up here off the, off the screen. This is the femoral artery, and then you can see there's this tiny little string of blood flow down here. Another thing to note, and the reason why if you have complete blockages, you don't lose your leg right away, because it happens over time, and your body is built to compensate for damage. So you have another artery, which is called the deep femoral artery, and see all these little guys here coming down? They're basically trying to find some way to get blood flow down to your foot. So they fit, these little tiny branches get bigger and bigger. Sometimes, and some people who've had it for a long time, you'll f it'll be just as big as the original blood vessel coming all the way down to your knee and giving you blood supply to your foot. So your body finds a way, and that's why these things develop over time, and there's ways to treat it and prevent ultimately losing your leg if you identify it and manage it properly. But here's a successful treatment of, of the artery endovascularly. This is just a, a ruler that you can put on the, dress, the dressing that's radio opaque. And then what you see is the flow is so rapid through this artery here, those collaterals are less prominent and less important because they're not forced to do all the work anymore. So that shows you that you successfully treated it. So open surgery, like I mentioned before, you can remove the plaque from inside the artery or bypass the blockage using a graft or a vein. So here's another person standing here, femoral artery. There is a blockage here. This is the popliteal artery. So this person opted to do a graft. Basically, you just, you can either get, so, so most patients, if we're doing a bypass graft, we like to use their own vein. The vein can be used as an alternate to an artery and it does a really good job. It can last, you know, 5, 10, 15 years in the right circumstances as a bypass conduit. And what it does is it gets what we call arterialized. So you take the vein out. It's a superficial vein that you don't need. You hook it up right here to the artery. And then you bypass the blockage and you hook it up. The important thing to know about it is you have to have what we call a target. You have to have an open artery past the point of blockage that's gonna provide the outflow for, you know, so, so if you have really severe disease in your ankles and your feet, you not, may not be able to get a bypass because there's nothing to bring the blood to. Yeah. So these are a couple other things. I did mention that sometimes smokers get blockages in their pelvis. So you can get an open surgery where you do a bypass to both legs 
to bypass blockage in the pelvis, one from the thigh all the way down to the foot. And sometimes there's a blockage here and you just go cross over from one side to the other. And you just do a bypass that way. Those can be done with synthetic grafts or with, ve with vein. Sometimes people use preserved cadaver aorta or femoral arteries. So it really depends on the circumstances. That sort of gets into very complex vascular surgery is not really the scope of what we're talking about here. But these things are, you know, depending on where you are, generally this is done by vascular surgeon. And this right here is just showing a plaque inside the artery and the plaque being removed. So depending on the location of the plaque, this is done or not done. Most of the time when you're talking about peripheral artery disease, you're going to do a bypass or you're going to do a stent or balloon from the inside. You very rarely go in and pull out the plaque um, in the artery just just the way that it works, based on the location of the artery, the extent of the disease process, and the benefit of the vessel from pulling that plaque out, whether it would heal or not, and how big it is, because you have to close it back up. Prognosis. So I talked a lot about you can lose your life, you can lose your limbs, that you have to be careful, and I don't want to be doomsday up here scaring everybody. It's, the prognosis is good for patients who don't have symptoms and or, and or have intermittent claudication. So Patients, 4 to 11 percent of patients who have no symptoms will progress to having symptoms in a five-year period. That means that 80 to 95 percent of patients with this disease process will never develop symptoms. And only a small minority of patients that have claudication will significantly worsen. So 20 percent will just become more severe claudication but less than 1% per year of those patients with claudication are at risk of losing their leg. So that's why it's so important to see a vascular specialist if you have these symptoms, because there are ways to prevent it from becoming a limb or a life loss situation. And odds are in your favor, if you take care of yourself once you've identified the disease, the odds are in your favor that you can do okay and you can not lose your leg. More severe disease, it needs to be closely watched, managed by a surgeon or a vascular specialist. People generally, once you get to the point where you have gangrene or ulceration or infection or severe pain, you require multiple treatments. Now sometimes you can do a bypass surgery and you heal and you do great for ever and you never have a problem again. That's generally seen in patients who have their disease from smoking and more commonly disease from diabetes because it's in the smaller vessels, lower down in the leg, requires more interventions and, and, and more maintenance and surveillance. So we as vascular surgeons watch our patients very closely. And we, if we do a treatment to open up a blockage, we follow the wound very closely, we make sure that their pain is gone, then we do follow up ultrasound tests or ABI like I mentioned, the, or a toe pressure to make sure that what it was before, it's now better, and it stays better the same way. And we, when we do bypass grafts, we do ultrasounds of them initially for every few months, and then every year after that to identify problems before they occur. So it's really important, just like you keep checking your blood pressure and going back, you know, check your blood sugar and you're treating it, that you're managing this as, as a chronic problem that it is. And knowing that having to go in for another treatment is not a failure, it's part of the disease process. Bypass surgery and endovascular treatments for, for peripheral vascular disease can both save your leg and improve your quality of life, and then sometimes they can even save your life. Especially in the case of infection and diabetes, you can get a severe life or limb-threatening infection and not even feel sick until you're already well past the point of being very sick. So taking good care of your feet, looking at your feet, listening to your body, examining yourself, knowing what's, you know, knowing what's not right and, and trusting yourself and having a do doctor who trusts you to also know that is really important. You know, it's definitely incumbent upon us as physicians to listen to our patients and to say they're coming to us with a concern and there's a change and they know their body and we need to, to listen to that and say, you know, we need to look into this and, and what's going on. So I, I think that's it. Thank you very much.